Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's The Cube at the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. With hosts Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Welcome back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and Paul Gillen is on as co-host. We're here with Peter Anlian, who is the co-chair of the MIT Information Quality Symposium. Peter, welcome back to theCUBE. It's great to see you again. Thanks, great to have you guys back. You did, uh, did a great job last year, and uh, a lot of folks have, have uh, viewed the content, and we expect the uh, same thing this year, so thank you. You're welcome. The, the conference is, is evolving, um, and you know, last year, it st struck a chord, a, a very strong chord around the chief data officer, and that seems to be the sort of main theme this year, but I wonder if you could talk about um, your role as co-chair and, and the program, the agenda that you guys put together and how it's evolved. Well, we made a shift from last year, and, and you're right, it's, it used to be the information quality uh, symposium, now it's the chief data officer and information quality symposium, and how does that all fit together? Well, you've got the emergence of this uh, chief data officer in our industry, and uh, it, it, there's a lot of talk about what exactly that means, and it's going to be different in every organization because they're all different chemistry. Uh, but uh, we're working on that. In fact, uh, Rich Wang, Yang Li, and Stu Madnick are uh, conducting research. Uh, they're getting a baseline, uh, doing, conducting a baseline uh, survey uh, to find out if you're a chief data officer, what does that mean in your organization? Uh, if your organization doesn't have one, uh, is there a de facto one that just hasn't gained that title yet, or are you nowhere near it? And I think that if you take that information uh, and you wrap uh, information quality around that, because obviously they're related, and then you place that in the context against this backdrop of big data, then you've got a, a very dynamic uh, a content that you can explore uh, in a symposium like this. So that's where we're headed. And, and the program this year, like last year, included a, is, am I correct, it included a separate CDO form or was that merged into uh, this one? No, it was actually separated out. We had that back in March. And it was in hosted DC, right? yeah, by Lockheed Martin in Arlington, Virginia. Very, so no cube there, very private. Oh yeah, <laughs> no. Uh, in the you, vault. No, yeah, you needed a password to get in. <laughs> <laughs> we opened a little door. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then, so talk about the two days, uh, uh, actually three days, right? So what's going on today and tomorrow and then, and then Friday? Well, we had a great morning session with Debbie Nightingale and Jeannie Ross from MIT. And uh, one thing we realized is you know, when you have these resources, you have something that is unique. We have a, a platform that is different from any other conference or symposium anywhere. And, and that's the, uh, the backdrop of MIT. So this year we decided to get the uh, internal MIT uh, experience uh, incorporated into the symposium, and I thought it was really strong, and uh, uh, we will do that next year and hopefully even more. Uh, the rest of the symposium is uh, made up of many panels uh, that were in some cases painstakingly put together, uh, and they are, I'd say there are about eight or nine titles that have big data in them. There are two or three that have CDO in them, and then there are many uh, of the rest that get a little bit more into the weeds. But uh, on the whole, we're uh, taking a, uh, a more of a balcony view of the industry than an in the weeds offering for the practitioners. So we're really appealing to leaders in the industry. Oh, Peter, this conference has its roots in, uh, in an academic conference. It was originally primarily uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, colleges and universities and, and has become, taken on more of a commercial tone over time. How are you balancing those needs to, to maintain those academic roots but also appeal to more of a, of a, a commercial user audience? Well, I think that uh, there's this, of course, symbiotic relationship. If you look around the campus of MIT, you've got names of many corporations on buildings, classrooms, et cetera. And that's, I think, the strength of what MIT has to offer. As an outsider, that's what I see. 
And uh, for this to be just an academic conference, I think, is very narrowly focused. Uh, I think the beauty of it is that we do have academia, uh, we've got industry, we've got research, uh, and you break down the industry into uh, uh, different branches. We, we cover a lot of territory. The, the MIT information quality function has been sort of crusading for information quality for a long time now, I believe over 20 years. Do you see the state of information quality? I mean, are we making progress? Is information quality getting better? Or is it becoming a bigger problem now that the data sets are getting bigger? Well, um, I, I've got, I think, a couple answers to that. Number one, it's, uh, you know, the old metaphor of trying to change a flat tire on an airplane while it's flying or a car while it's driving. Uh, that's what everybody's trying to do. And as we get more and more into the uh, big data, it's harder to keep up with that. Uh, so I, I can't say that it's getting better necessarily. Uh, when you look at the, the whole array of, uh, of businesses uh, to whom this matters, uh, from your large corporations on down to your small businesses, uh, I do believe that awareness is greatly heightened and that the general uh, corporate uh, and private company population has a, that greater awareness of what information means and how important it is. So I think you're seeing more activity uh, more in uh, businesses that weren't necessarily uh, technology oriented. So when you think about, I mean, this has been a topic for a long time, information asset and liability management, you know, you got two sides of the, the, the coin from a, you know, the balance sheet analogy. And prior to the big data meme, at least I felt that a lot of the discussion when it related to governance and what has now emerged as the, the CDO role uh, was sort of risk factors, data risk, the general counsel sort of driving the discussion and the CEO paying attention because he or she had to. Um, I, I feel as though that's flipped and it's become more of an opportunity. Um, in other words, you know, the bromide, of course, is data is the new source of competitive advantage, data is the new oil. Um, how much do you see that permeating organizations? And how real is that bit flip? Uh, and, and how has that affected sort of what you guys are doing? Well, I don't think that people uh, will get on the data quality a bandwagon until they have to, businesses that traditionally have not. Uh, I, I don't think until they see a competitive advantage that they're going to jump on board. Mm -hmm. um, here at the symposium, we are at the higher end of that. Uh, the, we uh, uh, attract people who uh, are well into those questions and trying to answer those and people who just woke up one day and somebody said, oh, uh, we're missing out on uh, a competitive advantage because we're not paying attention to these metrics. And you can get into it very easily uh, with just some basic data. And as you know uh, from your work and from the presentations here, it can scale very quickly and into some very complex. Well, and, and we heard from Rick Watson this morning that yeah. if you don't digitize your, your, <laughs> your you know, assets. Your, your ballers and in your parking lot. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm Those thinking are, of all the things I can digitize. That was pretty insightful. <laughs> we, we also heard from so, Jeannie Ross today uh, yeah. about you don't really, you may not really need big data. In fact, a lot of companies don't need big data. They should do better with, with the small data that they've got, uh, learn to crawl before you walk. Is that an issue that, At, do you think that the big data phenomenon Phenomenon is causing maybe causing companies to bite off more than they can chew. In some ways, yes. I mean, and when you get to conferences like this, you you've really got the, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, the you know the data nerds. Uh, we the people who just love the uh, intro. I mean, you can get into some conversations upstairs here where you get deeply into the weeds, and I get lost very quickly because I'm more of a systems thinker. Uh, it, I agree, it's not for everybody. If uh, the Small Business Administration, although this is changing, defines a small business at 500 employees or less. 500 employees is still a very big company. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, but uh, small businesses are responsible for uh, more jobs in this country than the large corporations are. Uh, they're uh, responsible uh, for uh, 
uh, more hires, more people, uh, hires that are coming out of uh, the schools, out of the technical schools, et cetera, the associate degrees. So I think that's where a lot of the fertile ground is. Uh, you know, you've got, that includes a company of six, Joe's Roofing Company, it includes a uh, regional broadcasting company, uh, all the way up to uh, some manufacturing companies. And, and uh, to me, that's the fertile ground. Now, you, you mentioned skills, and, and that's something that's new this year, is on day three of the conference, uh, you're going to address the data skills gap specifically. Well, what, what kind of a shortage is well, there? Uh, you know, there was this spate of uh, uh, surveys that uh, the, re the results of which were published in the last, since 2012, really. Uh, Gartner was kind of the landmark one that said that uh, by the year 2015, they're going to be 1.5 or 6 uh, million jobs coming online. We have enough talent to fill a little better than half of those. Uh, when I started doing some digging, I found that the industry was really pointing the finger at academia, saying we're not turning out data scientists. And I'm using data scientists broadly, we're not and the associated uh, skills. And so we have this proliferation of uh, master's programs. It's not happening at the PhD level. Master's programs are churning out uh, these graduates, and they're uh, moving right into the workplace, and they're highly sought after. Uh, Michael Rappa, uh, if you get a chance to talk to him again, North Carolina, yeah. uh, he has 86 graduates this past spring, and they all got three to four job offers, and they're all in the hundred, around hundred thousand dollar range, some significantly higher. Uh, so academia is responding, okay. But my question is, what are we doing back in the shop, in our corporation, to keep the people that we've got? Because there's a lot of churn in the industry. Uh, there's there are job offers uh, that are uh, hitting a lot of the talent in the industry. So we're not effectively taking care of what we've already got. And uh, that falls into the uh, leadership, communication, and teamwork ar uh, arena. Uh, if people aren't being heard, they're not going to stay. And what I think you'll also hear on Friday is that each of these master's programs has a curriculum that includes leadership, teamwork, communication. And when these kids, they're not all kids, when they're going into their practicums in industry, they're coming back and in some cases saying, you know, they're not practicing this stuff up uh, in the workplace. What you're telling us about communicating, mm -hmm. we're not seeing that happen. So is that stuff going to stay in school? Or is industry going to catch on and do something about that and really concentrate on hanging on to their talent? You, you talked about being in the weeds earlier, and I, I, I think that I, I'd make an observation that I think there'd be an abstraction layer between the hardcore data scientists who are programming and doing MapReduce <laughs> and, 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 and regular business people who just are are trained and have the, pr the processes in place to actually access data that they need and be able to make decisions on mm -hmm. that. So, while it's true, and everybody knows there's a big you know, uh, uh, skills gap, right. um, you don't necessarily have to close that gap with hardcore data scientists. It's like, I remember uh, somebody in theCUBE telling the story that, that the automobile industry was very concerned early on um, with no, there not being enough chauffeurs to drive the cars. <laughs> so, <laughs> or in a telephone operator, yeah, right? Right, exactly. So we so, make everyone into telephone operators. So the right. question is, is there a similar analogy here where there's, as I say, this abstraction layer where you don't have to necessarily have that deep, intense, whether it's mathematical skills or programmatical skills. Well, one of the prescriptions uh, for more effective and efficient uh, output is teams, where we don't need to have everybody be a great communicator or a leader, uh, we, we can have a team uh, with the different disciplines uh, that we need to attack a project and get it done in, in the best fashion possible. Uh, Accenture came out with a, a paper on that. I've seen a couple of others. And, uh, but when you start talking about teamwork, then you get into some of the basic uh, questions again. Uh, do we just tell these teams what's right and what's wrong for working together, or are we going to uh, be able to 
uh, foster those behaviors in that team to get the most out of them. So big data is a team sport. Should be. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Is there hope for the uh, for the softer skills? For the people who don't have uh, the hardcore data analytics type of skills, but uh, uh, but still want to take advantage of opportunities in this market? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, Paul Barth uh, said that uh, this, the technology is really getting easier, uh, but he says what is absolutely needed is uh, more effective leadership. And as that message spreads. Uh, you look at uh, CEOs of companies who came from different industries uh, who uh, are really out of their, uh, you would think, uh, comfort zone, but they come in and they have the leadership skills to uh, just look at whatever this new industry for them is uh, as a, uh, uh, in the same light that they saw their, their former company. And they're, and they're successful at that. Um, I should have but, a good example, but I don't. Well, well but the leaders, uh, we also hear that, that you can't make decisions today without data. The, the, the days of seat of the pants decision making are over. In fact, is that the future you envision or is there still a role for, uh, for intuition in decision making? Absolutely, there's a role for intuition, but there's this basic skill called inspiring a shared vision and this goes back to Jim Collins uh, Kuzis and Posner, uh, the Leadership Challenge. Where there's a difference between inspiring a shared vision and sharing an inspired vision. And the very successful leaders inspire a shared vision. That means everybody gets to contribute to it. That doesn't mean we all get in the huge auditorium and wordsmith a vision statement, but that means that I as the CEO, you guys as the C-suite, you as the middle managers are going into the front lines, you're spending time, you're listening, uh, you're taking that feedback into account, you're making sure those folks know they were heard, and you're, that, they're helping to shape the direction of the company because they're seeing things that we in the C-suite aren't seeing, okay? Uh, I, a company I used to work for, the CEO used to gather all the administrative assistants and secretaries into a room at lunch because he believed those were the people who really knew what was going on in the company. And he listened. He was probably right. He was, yeah. and he listened. And a lot of us uh, still don't do that. We're afraid to ask those questions because when we get feedback, we have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us don't know what to do with it. And there are methods for dealing with it effectively that aren't going to uh, take up all your time. Peter, a lot of stakeholders this year at the conference. You see from the, the backdrop behind us, um, more constituents. You, you've sort of opened up the the umbrella, or is it these just guys that were involved before and you're sort of giving formal recognition? What's going on there? We have a lot of new faces this year, uh, which is, I think, a, a really good sign. Uh, we uh, got a lot of last minute interest. People heard about what was going on. We, we were uh, snowballing uh, toward uh, today, and uh, I think it had to do somewhat with social media, Paul, and, and word of mouth. Uh, we also made a concerted effort, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to uh, make sure that we had some thought leaders who uh, would invite other people to come out. As you look ahead <coughs> to, the, to the future of this event, uh, where do you uh, where do you plan to take it? Is could this become as big as as it'll get? I mean, could you see eventually having hundreds, thousands of people attending? Uh, will you intentionally keep it more intimate? Um, <coughs> is, is, will will it, its academic versus commercial <coughs> orientation change in the future? Where do you see no. it going? I think that the academic slash industry combination is is unique especially as tied to MIT. I don't think we want it to get too big uh, because I think that uh, it will lose some of its effectiveness. We don't want to be in a civic center uh, with you know, 3,000 chairs in with two large screens. Uh, I, I just think uh, the, the intimate aspects of it are, are part of what make it special. And as you start coming for one, two, or three years in a row, you see a lot of the same faces here. I see Joe McGuire standing right there. And um, you establish relationships, and that's really what it's all about. I think we'd like to grow 
another we're a little over 300 people this year I think we'd like to grow another couple of hundred mm -hmm. uh, but we're not going to do it at the uh, uh, if, if it uh, doesn't happen in the organic fashion that we've been growing the last couple of years. How about your uh, your your consulting firm? We did a little gig earlier this year. You had me Skype in. What's, what's going on there? Thank you. That was yeah. fun. Um, I am working with. Uh, and, and we got uh, Dave to uh, be online with us uh, with an outfit called Groundwork Labs, where they uh, it's an accelerator in Durham, North Carolina, which is becoming more and more of a hotbed mm, sure. for startups. And uh, Dave, being the startup guru that he is, we uh, <laughs> interviewed him in uh, front of a room full of entrepreneurs and, and archived it online. And it's going really well. In fact, when I get back to town, I've got a new class Monday and Tuesday coming in. And these people, it's so refreshing working with these people because they're hungry for uh, new knowledge. They're hungry to find out who they are, uh, the tools that they bring. Uh, to their projects, uh, their new companies, uh, what's missing, what's their, what are their strengths, and uh, to see some of them uh, go on to, to be very successful. Uh, we have, uh, in this latest class, we had a company that has a new um, uh, device that'll hold the chest open, a retractor, for heart surgery. Okay, we have another company that developed a uh, fingernail polish for girls that will immediately detect the date rape drug if they're at a party. Now what parent isn't going to make Whoa. sure that Where do I get that? Up, right? <laughs> right. Huh? right? Where do I get two daughters? Okay. Where do I get that? And then we have games, we have <laughs> uh, a startup that is kind of an Airbnb for hostels around the world and it's, imagine how much fun that is to have all these different uh, people come through with these great ideas. And, and mostly are all millennials, right? Mostly, yeah. Uh, you know, you'll love this. So we're doing a, a partnership with um, the International House uh, down in Harlem and the Global Post and the Ground Truth with Charles Sennett. And uh, the theme of the conference that theCUBE will be at is Generation TBD. It's all about youth unemployment. And the reason we're there is obviously to broadcast. They love the Cube, <laughs> But also kind of exporting that, that Silicon Valley entrepreneurialism, which is what you're doing nice. in Chapel Hill, right? Yeah. And Durham. that you know, is one answer anyway, or Durham, yeah. right? One, one answer anyway to this, you know, so the youth unemployment problem. So I'm glad to see you attacking it. Well, it's kind of like the, uh, when you, our downtown died like most downtowns did back in the 70s, yeah, 80s, right. and it just started coming back about six or seven years ago. But artists used to be the group that would help revive it. They'd move in, they'd be <laughs> in these uh, dilapidated apartments, and right. then uh, the uh, business folks would come in and raise the rents and move them out. Well, uh, the, these entrepreneur scenes are kind of the same thing. They bring this excitement, this freshness, this, this youth uh, that really uh, is key in revitalizing. Yeah, a lot of positive momentum. Well, so, yeah. I mean, being in, in the Durham area, which has been such a, uh, such a hotbed of technology innovation for, for several decades, have you seen the, uh, the profiles of these startups change as data has become more ubiquitous, more available, more immediate, more mobile, are you seeing uh, different kinds of startups emerge out of that? I'm seeing a lot of apps. I'm seeing uh, everybody needing uh, technical help. Um, and the, the websites and the tools that they need to incorporate into those are getting very sophisticated, complex. Uh, they're always trying to figure out where, you know, th they're straddling the fence. Uh, we don't have money to pay somebody, do we give them equity? Uh, do we go overseas? Uh, where are we going to find this type of help? Do we take longer and do it ourselves? Uh, but it, it's actually a, a really good question because um, uh, they need technology, they need uh, data, and uh, I think uh, all of them really depend on it. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I'm seeing right, more of that. Peter, we got to leave it there. The next yes, guest sir. is the, the planes are backing up, as uh, Mark Hopkins says. But really, th in thank there. you so much for having us again this year. Thanks, guys. All great, the great to work have you that here. You put into it. All right, pleasure. Take care. Good to see you again. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Paul and I and Jeff will be back. We're live. This is the Cube from MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right back. <laughs>